Today I'm bringing you all another Grand Archive TCG deck profile for the Set 3 Alchemical Revolution metagame, and this one is super exciting because in this deck we are using the Alchemical Revolution Divine Relic Temporal Spectrometer, and honestly everyone, I think it is pretty good in here and deserves another look. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, but this list is going to be a Wind Hybrid Lorraine and Merlin deck profile. It's got a tight material deck, but it's got a powerful main deck and a lot of really cool effects. So let's jump into this list, let's take a look at it, and we'll let you know how this deck works. What's up everyone, it's Dan with Main Deck, and I'm back. It's been a little bit, but I'm back with another Grand Archive deck profile for you all. This deck is, uh, this is an interesting one. This is something that the Main Deck competitive team has been working on for a while. We have had several iterations of this, and if you listen to the Recollection Step podcast, Taylor and I did talk about how we were working on this list and ultimately a bunch of us audible, but a few still played it and performed pretty admirably with it. This list has been modified since then. One thing that happened was that True Champion Gaming's starter deck Lorraine, as we like to call it, uh, list was shown off, and we took a couple ideas from there, integrated them in with the list we were building, and ultimately, I'm at a point where I think I am very happy with how this list plays with the one major change that happened to it very recently, which is trying out and really enjoying Temporal Spectrometer, the Divine Relic from Alchemical Revolution. So what we're going to do is just go through the list as usual, explain everything to you guys, explain the thought behind this deck, and then you guys can go ahead and take it for a spin, try it out, modify it however you'd like, and see if you can come up with your favorite version of this list. But I really enjoy where it's at right now. I think it is really solid and has a lot of game against a lot of decks, maybe a little bit lacking against Luxem Xander and Erupting Rhapsody sometimes, but it still can have game there as needed, especially with some particular sideboard tweaks. So last thing I want to mention before we go to the list is that this is an expensive deck. You'll see that we do run Academy Guide, Dungeon Guide, and Ghosts of Pendragon in here. These are all very expensive cards and well, I actually think you can build this deck and play this deck pretty successfully without Academy Guide. Uh, I think it's quite good, but I think you could, you don't need it for sure. I do think Dungeon Guide and Ghost of Pendragon are pretty important to have, especially all the way at four of if possible. So if you don't have at least a few copies of each of those, you might want to look for a different win list to build and play with. But if you've got the copies floating around, it's at least three of them or something. Um, and especially if you've got the Academy Guides, I think you'll have a ton of fun trying this deck list out. So let's start with the Material deck. Of course, we are running a Spirit of Wind because we're playing Wind, although we have just heard that in Mercurial Heart, there'll be a new set of spirits as well, which I'm really excited to see how our choices start to tweak from then. But for now, good old Draw 7 Spirit of Wind is wonderful to play with. Lorraine level 1, of course, is being played in here, and if you haven't seen her before, she makes a sword, and she's awesome, and she can level up into either Lorraine or Merlin, which are going to be our preferred routes to go, as this is a hybrid deck. So, Lorraine Blade Master and Lorraine Spirit Ruler is one fork, one one tine of our fork of champion levels to go through. Um, as a hybrid list, what you want to do is you are going to go up to either champion path, depending on kind of what your hand looks like, what your opponent's board looks like, what your opponent's deck is trying to do. Generally, the Lorraine path is for dealing with go wide ally strategies. If there are two to four, I mean, four is a really good day for you, but two to four allies in play and you have seen that copy of Hurricane Sweep, then you are really looking at going to Lorraine level two. There are also times when this plus two damage can just be essentially, even if you don't have the sweep for knocking an ally out that you have to get rid of, or for actually just ending the game early, it's possible to aggro out a little bit and then get in with something like a sudden steal at a plus two on the Lorraine level two. So um, it's, that's especially against like level one decks like Xander, if they kind of stall out a little bit and can't get a kill on you, then you are able to just kind of sweep in and take them out without having to push too much extra damage. And then we have Lorraine level three in here as a way to then uh, activate our crux because you need to get your crux online to have your real end game with this deck. And then her on enter, of course, will allow you to take a sword regalia from your banishment and put it into play. So you ideally want to go to her after you've gotten like a drawn blade out and used it or something. Uh, drawn blade will then allow you to draw a card when you uh, materialize it the first time and then draw another card when Lorraine puts it out for a little bit of extra value. Useful to do, not totally essential because the core of this deck is we're trying to just level as efficiently as possible and that's where Temporal Spectrometer is going to be a really cool card to play with. 
Um, our other uh, tie into the fork here, as we said, is the Merlin path. Merlin level two allows you to banish guard with floating memory to put a level counter on her. Obviously, you usually want to do that on the opponent's floating memory, but you have enough floating memory in here and enough other ways to get advantage that it's actually not the end of the world if you just want to banish your own floating memory so that you can get that level counter because having the level counter on Merlin before you go to three allows you to immediately get Merlin level threes when you have an even number of level counters on the first recollection step uh, in order to draw an extra card and get plus two damage to your attacks that turn. Don't forget too, this Merlin's really good against fighting against decks like Erupting and stuff. You can just banish their fire element cards to try and keep them off of having a ton of damage, but you generally don't want to be sticking on level two too long. We really just want to get leveled up here, get our crux online and go to town. So um, that is uh, Merlin, the Merlin path. And I think the Merlin path is going to be the most common path you're going to take with this deck, especially because we are running Incarnate Majesty in the main board. Um, and you are just really going to want to get your ghosts online, get your Merlin uh, going to get drawing cards every recollect or every other recollection step with Merlin, plus damage on the attacks every other recollection step, and then draw your cards off your ghosts and just build a massive hand and basically um, use all of your cool win cards to become basically invincible. So that's, that's the goal of that. We have Sword of Seeking in here. Sword of Seeking, the true sight's useful, and of course it's our choice for going Mer uh, Lorraine level 1's free weapon materialize. We have Majestic Spirit in here because we are playing Incarnate Majesty. We want to get Majestic Spirit down as soon as we can because it will just lock down the game against so many decks. Ally decks have a, a hell of a time trying to get through the Majestic Spirit with its damage prevention and its intercept and its true sight and its vigor. It can knock out allies and untap and run the opponent out of resources fairly short order. So it's an incredible card. You are, obviously, if you haven't seen this before, you're never going to materialize it for the cost of 12. You use the card Incarnate Majesty to put the Majestic Spirit into play instead. Okay, so let's talk about Temporal Spectrometer. So this card got highly maligned right when it was previewed from a Chemical Revolution. Well, first of all, people were reading it wrong. And then second, it got maligned. So um, what does this do? Temporal Spectrometer is a zero cost divine relic with rest, put a time counter on Temporal Spectrometer. And then while paying for a memory cost, you may sacrifice Temporal Spectrometer to pay for X of that cost, where X is the amount of time counters on Temporal Spectrometer. So Temporal Spectrometer is a card that allows you to pay for memory costs, memory costs being the, these blue costs on the cards in your material deck, okay? And it, this, this can pay for any memory cost, meaning it can also be used to pay for leveling up to level two or level three. Um, or even level one is a, is a possibility. Oh, it's not the best value you can get with it. Um, and that's usually what you are trying to do with Temporal Spectrometer. Every single turn, you just rest it to put a time counter on it until the turn when you want to use it to level up. Now, keep in mind, if you're not familiar with the intricate timing rules of Grand Archive, there is no opportunity to activate an effect before you have materialized on your turn, which means that at the start of your turn with a Spectrometer in play, you will wake it up then move to materialize. You don't have a chance to put a time counter on it and you must choose before you have any opportunity to materialize something. So the uh, the turn that you go to materialize something, you don't get to put a time counter on it before you materialize or anything. That's, that's not, the card would be like really insane though. If you could do that, it's really good already. It doesn't need that added on to it also. Um, the big problem with this, so it's like every turn you put a time counter on, it just builds up, and after two turns, you can materialize your level two for free. After three turns, you can materialize your level three for free. And keep in mind, too, you can add costs to this. You can uh, you can go ahead and spend this to pay for two of your level three, and then use a floating memory for the third one, or banish a card for the third one. Um, this generally is a card that can be that can act like you have two or three cards in hand. Meaning it's like where Grand Crusader's Ring gives you one card, Temporal Spectrometer can give you up to two or three if you give it a few turns to build up. Um, the big cost to this is that your opponent can interact with this. So cards like Varrican Acolyte, Spurn to Ash, Fracture Eyes, Zephyr, these are all things that can target Regalia and uh, I'll sometimes get rid of them, I guess. Um, so a lot of people took their hands right off of Temporal Spectrometer right away, because, right away because they thought, I, you know, there's no point in putting this out there. It's going to be a liability. People are just going to get rid of it. It's, it's susceptible to removal, which is absolutely true. However, the thing that I think about spectro, spe, Temporal Spectrometer that I don't know if people are considering super heavily is 
which decks in the metagame are actually going to have those answers in their main board currently or even in their sideboard. Um, and of those answers, which of them are actually big losses for you if they use them? I'd say the, the reason that we started using this is we started to notice that the only decks that were really actively running multiple copies, if consistent copies of things like Spurn to Ash or Varrican Acolyte uh, are erupting decks. And erupting decks, you are going to often want to side out your Divine Relic anyway for this lovely Quicksilver Grail so that your Nullifying Lantern can be super protected. Um, against... Uh, and, and plus with those decks, they generally want to save their things like Spurn to Ash to be able to deal with Nullifying Lantern. So wasting it on a Temporal Spectrometer uh, might not actually even be a great call for them, depending on the situation. So it, even in game one, it's it can be okay. You just might want to be a little faster about activating it. Just use it to level up the very next turn. It gives them this push where they have to go, okay, well, I have to answer it right now. And they might think that you're going to be greedier with it, but just use it right away to get a level and then it's not a liability. And then it was basically a Grand Crusader's Ring for you. Um, now against water decks, they can fracturize it, certainly. And if they fracturize it, it becomes a reservable Fantasia for you. And it now it counts as always basically having a card in hand. So once again, it was kind of like a Grand Crusader's Ring. It's a little worse than a Grand Crusader's Ring, but that's the cost that we play for this potential upside. Uh, and against a wind deck, the best they can really do is delay it by using something like Zephyr on it to suppress it. When they do that, it will remove any time counters on it. It'll come in fresh and you'll have to go ahead and rest it again, which you can do right after it comes back in uh, from the suppress ending. Um, so, you know, it's a it's sort of a tempo loss, but they go down a card to do it. It's... Uh, it's just not really the end of the world, and usually there are things that they'd care more about suppressing than Temporal Spectrometer, unless you've got your, unless you're kind of being greedy and you've got up to three counters or whatever. You just have to kind of suss out your opponent's deck, try and figure out what kind of answers they're running, but in a lot of those situations, Temporal Spectrometer is um, a pseudo Grand Crusader's Ring. It's at least worth a card, or it's taken the opponent down a card. And in the situations where that doesn't happen, which in my experience is actually a surprising amount of them, this card is worth two or three cards if you materialize it early, and it can allow you to get to that level three while having a ton of cards in hand, allowing you to keep up interaction or get your ghost down right away and get your Incarnate Majesty down even faster. So I've really enjoyed playing this card. I highly recommend people give it a try and I think this is a good deck for it because this is one where you definitely want to be leveling to three fairly efficiently. I think people should be looking at this a little more. Now to finish up the material, like I, knew, I knew in this video we're going to do a huge talk about Temporal Spectrometer because nobody's playing it but I do think it's a card that deserves more look and I thought the attention was warranted. Drawn Blade is in here again because this is a great combo piece with Lorraine level 3 in order to draw a card and then get it back. Um, and then with Ghosts of Pendragon, this is a card that you can just, every materialized phase, you can lose a card you don't care about to draw a new card and then ghost it back into your material deck so that you can draw two more cards. So obviously it's a really sweet combo with that. Tithe Proclamation is in here. This isn't a card that people mainboard a lot, but when you're playing Ghosts of Pendragon, it's a card I like to have another copy of because sometimes you'll, through one situation or another or removal, you'll have you'll lose your drawn blade or you have to use it in an attack or something. And in those cases, having another tithe, another card that has unentered draw card allows you to, you know, loop those Ghosts of Pendragons or in a worst case scenario, you can Zephyr it just to get a card draw. Um, and then occasionally against certain decks and, you know, against Erupting or against Rai decks, you can slow them down a little bit by stopping the amount that they're able to draw cards with Tithe to. And then we have Safeguard Amulet, which is a card that has a lot of uses in the current metagame. It's really good against uh, Scepter of Lumina, especially the, the dungeon guide turns where they're trying to level up multiple times. It's really good against Fire Xander Aggro. It is solid against Erupting as, as just an extra kind of floodgate lever just to kind of keep them off of dealing enough damage to you. And combined with Veiling Breeze in this deck, you can prevent an awful lot of damage to yourself. Um, so it's my preferred. I prefer mainboarding this in the current meta right now. But... Based on your meta, if you have like a lot of ally decks you're playing, go ahead and put the Terra Frank into the main instead. I think that'll serve you very well as well. That'll come in, this will come in uh, from the board fairly often, I think, um, if you have a lot of ally decks. So you might as well main board that then. But as usual, you know, your sideboard, your material deck choices, very dependent on your metagame and make sure you make the best choices for you. But I am a fan of Safeguard Amulet here. So um, that's our material deck. The big thing with the material deck is because we're hybrid and Lorraine, we are super, super tight. We only really have 
uh, three slots outside of her Divine Relic to mess with, and so these are the three we chose. Um, but that said, you know, after you board in, you can freely do things like take out the Lorraine levels if you're not going to need them to put in some more of these uh, material deck cards that are going to be more useful, things like Viridian Protective Trinket and Terrafring against Water Allies, or the uh, Nullifying Lantern can come in with the Quicksilver replacing the Temporal Spectrometer against Erupting. So go ahead and tweak things as you need, as you see fit. Um, now let's look at the main board. The main deck in this deck is, uh, like I said, we took a little bit of inspiration from uh, Team True Champion Gaming's starter deck, uh, win starter deck Lorraine deck from Nationals. Um, and we are now running four Academy Guides and four Dungeon Guides. Truth be told, we were testing this just a little bit the night before Nationals, and we didn't quite get up to four Academy Guides, but we were really lost in a weird metagame and didn't realize just the potency of having this in here. So the Academy Guides and Dungeon Guides are here because these are two parts of just your, I'm going to find a way to efficiently level package because your goal is just to get to three and then control the game. So you need all the ways you can to efficiently do that. Academy Guide makes it so you only have to pay, well, you pay one less anytime you want to level, combined with a few different floating memory options in here, and then things like Temporal Spectrometer now. There are a bunch of ways to get very free levels out of this if you can keep it in play. And we, of course, play a few cards like Reclaim and Favorable Wins, which allow us to kind of hold down the fort on the Academy Guide. Favorable Wins can sometimes save her from, uh, you know, a desperate attack to try and get rid of her. Reclaim is the card you, if you your starting hand is like uh, Academy Guide and Reclaim, you just go play Academy Guide, keep Reclaim up. The opponent tries to answer the guide, you Reclaim the guide, and now you can spend the floating memory to level, and then you can put the guide back down again and try and kind of control the board and protect her once again. So it's a great little combo that makes sure that you're not going to be paying too much and can invalidate some cards the opponent plays as well, which is really nice. If they go for like a Focus Flame in the Academy Guide and you have the Reclaim, that is, that's like a best case scenario. That's awesome. Dungeon Guide, of course, you want to try to use it going from level 2 to 3 when possible. However, that cheeky Dungeon Guide to level 2 Merlin to banish a floating memory before the opponent gets suspended, don't forget about that play. That is sometimes a nice one. And again, with Spectrometer, you have ways to get those cards back. You're going to lose an extra card doing that to go to level 2 with a Dungeon Guide but Temporal Spectrometer can sort of make that value up later if you play it. Some games you're just going to play Temporal Spectrometer like at turn two, just go like, well, if I'm not under a lot of threat based on what my hand looks like, I'll just play Spectrometer now because you can go Spectrometer into uh, leveling to one next turn, into uh, leveling to two with the, using the Spectrometer so it was totally free and then dungeon guide to three and you'll be at dun you'll be at level three and you'll still have like six cards in hand or something. It's like feels it, uh, six influence, I should say. So not in hand. You might have three cards in hand, but you have like six influence still at that point. It just feels it feels powerful to do that. Um, so yeah, dungeon guide, critical part of that play. We have four swift recruit. It's an ally with floating memory and it intercepts and it holds down the fort and it, it makes your opponent have to fight through to get a reddening flame through or something. He's great. He's always really good. Four dream fairy, one of the best cards in the game on the uh, watch list for the bit, not, not the ban list, but on the category of watching. Uh, for a good reason, dream fairy can answer anything. Dream fairy can answer majestic spirits. In, uh, in mirror matches against other Merlin decks, Dream Fairy could just answer random allies and it's just hard to deal with with stealth. She's so good. And of course, we're running things like Reclaim in here where you're able to just pick her back up or Zephyr her again to keep uh, just returning different allies to the opponent's uh, memory and just making it very difficult for them to play the game and get damage through. We run two Tactful Sergeants here. Tactful Sergeant is is just an okay ally in this version of this deck where sometimes, you know, you pull off a little attack with Sword of Seeking and can use the Tactful Sergeant to build another card up because, again, we're just trying to, we're trying to get to level three with as many cards as possible. So she's good for that. Um, kind of expensive sometimes, but, you know, she does a good job and, and she's a reasonable card in here. Certainly a slot where I would say, you know, you could flex a little bit and change some cards around if you want to, but I tend to like the couple copies of, of her in here. She tends to be all right. Uh, Rose is a card I've really enjoyed quite a bit, though. Again, this is another four-cost card. These four-cost cards are just a little bit clunky sometimes until you get to that, like, 12-card hand in the end game. Um, but Rose is a really, really potent little surprise for dealing with things like, uh, heavy swings from Guardian or Rending Flames from Assassin or something. Um, she can, once you get to level two, which you're hoping to get there pretty quick, she can come in and change the target of that attack to her. 
Um, with that fast activation, which is really, even if you have to sack her, I mean, you're gonna happily lose one card from your hand to stop that heavy swing from dealing nine to you a lot of the time. Um, and then otherwise against like decks like Xander, I'm, honestly, you can't under, uh, underestimate the power of a two, three with intercept. Those stats are for an interceptor just are not all that common. You usually have to pay more for that for like veteran soldier. And she has true sight as well. So she is able to intercept anything and she can take out assassin cards with that true sight if you need her to um she's she's awesome i really like her you can play her turn one if you absolutely have to you can also just play her late in the game as just a beater fast activation put her down and then start attacking the opponent with her next turn um as one of your routes of just finishing the game because you do have to finish the game with a wind deck eventually um but yeah she's she's been awesome like her at two quite a bit Fairy Whispers, we have it four of here. Now, this is where like, I, we tried things like Rally the Peasants in here, but in this version of this deck without the Banner Knights and we tried Phalanx Captain, it was a little awkward. Um, it just, there weren't enough humans to really feel like Rally the Peasants worked a lot, but I like Fairy Whispers a ton. Um, it's cheap and efficient. It glimpses three, which if you find a bunch of cards you don't care about, you just put them on the bottom. If you find a card you care about and a win card, you get to put the win card on top, reveal it, and then move to your draw step. Like using this during recollection phase is awesome. Just to find, yeah, this is the exact card I want to draw this turn. We'll get rid of this stuff and we'll draw the Ghost of Pendragon or the Incarnate Majesty, and then we'll go to town. Um, it just, four copies of this help you find the key cards you need to survive, like Veiling Breeze. Uh, or Hurricane Sweep in order to wipe the board, or Dream Fairy in order to deal with a threat, or Rose to be able to stop something, or Innervate, which is going to be a... It's just a I, I actually tried this in the side for a while. And I was like, no, 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 I like this in the main. This is really good in here. So um, Innervate's sometimes going to be a clutch card too. So Fairy Wizards, just, it just helps you dig and find those cards. So it's awesome. Veiling Breeze just a, a savior card that you're going to need to have this is this is how you get to this end game and you just sort of lock things down because the opponent just will try everything they can will have trouble getting through you a lot of the time uh, veiling breeze just prevents a whole bunch of damage and only costs once it's super easy to keep up you just have to make sure you put your win cards down appropriately when you're using this so that you can reveal enough win cards to prevent damage but it prevents every bit of damage that would be dealt to your champion that turn each time damage would be dealt you prevent that much with veiling breeze so Wonderful card. Great card to have uh, in the late game. You want to be holding it. If you're holding a couple of copies of these and have the Majestic Spirit in play, your opponent often just needs to pack it up. It's going to be tough uh, to get through that at that point. Um, Zephyr. Zephyr a four of as well because it is so flexible. It does so many things. Suppresses enemy allies or regalia. Again, they can do things like go for that Rending Flames with a... Uh, a uh, Assassin's Ripper. I'm just trying to think of the name. The, the Assassin's Ripper on the Assassin deck. You can Zephyr the Assassin's Ripper so they don't get that damage buff on their Rending Flames, and the Rending Flames gets basically totally neutered from that. Um, you can also use it to suppress your own Majestic Spirit when they, uh, your opponent tries to Dream Fairy it or something. You can use it to get rid of an opponent's Dream Fairy to unlock something to play or, get, or bounce your own Dream Fairy so that you can uh, hit something else with it. Super, super flexible card. And I guess if people start playing Temporal Spectrometer, you can use it to try and tempo them a little bit by uh, by suppressing the Temporal Spectrometer. Hey, always an option. But like I said earlier also, um, if you need to, just suppress a Tithe Proclamation to turn this into pay to, you know, cycle this card, discard, draw a card. Um, that works too, because sometimes it's just that late game, you just need to find the right card to win the game, like Incarnate Majesty. So if you need to, you need to. Uh, reclaim floating memory card that bounces something in order to save it from damage or something like that or bounce a dream fairy again to reset it, or bounce a rose so that you can reuse the rose that's also super good bounce tactful sergeant so you can get another card off of her there's a ton of reasons to like reclaim in this deck um and and it's yeah it's it's awesome awesome to have bounce academy guide being the thing like i talked about earlier that you're going to really want to do to efficiently level early on Favorable Winds, another floating memory card. If the damage is right, Favorable Winds can be really awesome. Having this two cards left in hand, your opponent is going to be like, ah, oh, do they have the Favorable Winds? And it's it's nice when you do, but it's not a key card, but at two, it's just fine. Now, Innervate Agility is in the main board, and I quite like this card in the main board. Like I said, I've tested it out of the deck entirely, tested it in the sideboard. I like it the most in the main board, even though there's a couple people on the main deck team who might disagree with me here. I actually think it's really, really excellent um, against a lot of decks, especially when they are going wide with allies, and sometimes those ally decks can just go a little too fast for you, and what you'll find is you'll need to go to Lorraine level 2 just to keep up with those decks. Having the Innervate to then go back down to 1, 
heal five, and then start going up the Merlin route if you've sort of run your opponent out of cards a little bit. If you've, uh, you can go through a couple Innervades doing this if you need to, because again, with things like Temporal, Academy Guide, there are ways to level a bit more efficiently than there used to be. Keep in mind too, Academy Guide and Innervate Agility are best friends. Uh, because Innervate can give stealth to everything, or Spell Shroud to everything, including your guide and your champion, so that it can't be touched, and then when you next turn you can go into to level back to two or something, and you'll you'll get this cost reduction on it as well, because your opponent couldn't touch the guide. So uh, they work really, really nicely together. And I've, I've just found by, you know, since we lose so much material deck space going this hybrid route, being able to make sure we can maximize our usage of our champions feels the most effective to me. So I really like these two Innervate Agilities here. As a reminder, you must have taken five damage in order to use this. Recover five is a cost of the card. So you have to have a level to go down to, and you have to have, uh, well, you could lose the game instead, but don't do that. You want to have a level to go down to, and you have to have taken five damage, or you cannot activate Innervate Agility at all. So make sure to take that damage, but usually that's not too hard, especially when you really need this card. Um, we have three Hurricane Sweeps main, and there is a fourth on the side, as well as a third Innervate Agility in the side. So um, if you really need it against those ally decks, you can side in the fourth one, but for now, having the three in the main is tends to get you one when you need it. Really great, obviously, going to Lorraine level two to draw a bunch of cards and then turn on that Innervate agility so that you can get back down and then keep going back up to Merlin or something. But uh, also really good just when you get to Merlin level three because Merlin level three also gets plus two damage to her attacks every other turn. Don't forget that. And at that point, um, her Hurricane Sweep will be free. So you are able to, uh, for free, then use this Hurricane Sweep for three or four damage if you have a sword to use also. Um, which is gonna, you know, keep the board clear late game and just run the ally decks out of steam entirely, which is awesome. Uh, we have two Savage Slash in here. It's just a, it's a nice card for dealing with an ally early on with, in conjunction with Sword of Seeking. It's a three damage true sight attack that then you can spend to level up. You know, it's, this is, it's effectively a plus one um, when you're dealing with something on the board and then using it to level. So it's a great little card to have. It's not wind, so it's not, we don't have a ton of copies of it. You know, wind cards are great to have because Veiling Breeze is critical to be able to have wind cards to use. Um, and also, it, you know, they can be found with Fairy Whispers, but it's solid. Another card that is effectively a two damage uh, plus one every time is if it removes an opponent's ally is Wind Cutter. Um, wind Cutter is, uh, we have in three copies of here because it is wind. Um, and it's also better to have late game once you get to this Merlin level and you're just trying to push some damage to close the game. Being able to start the turn with a Wind Cutter with a guaranteed wind reveal so that you keep this in your memory for a little four damage poke at the opponent before you start swinging with uh, uh, Ghost of Pendragon and stuff like that. Wind Cutter is awesome. It does it does a lot of work in here. I think this card has been getting undervalued a little bit because ally decks are quite popular right now, and uh, an attack that doesn't put you down a card and deals with an ally is actually quite, quite useful. So really like Wind Cutter in here. We have three copies of Sudden Steel. This is just a way to help close the game in the late game. Um, it is a six cost with efficiency, five damage attack. So often when you get to that Merlin late game, this is just a free five damage attack, usually a free seven damage or eight damage attack. If you have Merlin's buff and or a sword in play, uh, which is plenty to get the game closed. Like we're like that. We're talking heavy swing levels at this point. So this card is good. People, I think people don't sleep on it. It's, it's great. It's still a really good attack. Um, really excellent in warrior and sometimes level two, you can use it just to close the game as well as a seven damage swing, uh, for just four at that point. So. Um, that is basically a heavy swing in the rain, which is awesome. Uh, and finally, we have a crux package for Ghosts of Pendragon. You gotta run Ghosts because Ghosts is the best way we have of drawing cards in the game right now. It's just efficient, puts down a huge body, draws you cards, can be used to reuse Drawn Blade and Tithe Proclamation, or just keep popping a sort of Seeking back in. Um, so that you're just getting extra cards each turn, depending on how many ghosts you have. Uh, Zephyr Ghost of Pendragon, if you want to draw some more cards. Reclaim Ghost of Pendragon, if you want to draw some more cards. Um, it's just, it's sick. It's so sick. Ghost of Pendragon is an absurd card. Uh, Incarnate Majesty. Uh, this is obviously when you're going the Merlin route, the card you're going to want to have. However, we have played this on the Lorraine route as well. This is not a dead card in Lorraine by any stretch because you are able to stall the game out a pretty long ways and, you know, be efficient enough with your cards where it is possible to play this for uh, usually 11 or 10 for having a couple swords revealed, but that efficiency is only active for Merlin. So you, you don't get any level bonus on there as well, but you can get to the point where you can still incarnate with 
uh, Lorraine. So keep that in mind. But obviously, you prefer to do this with Merlin. Put that spirit into play. Lock the game down because half of all damage is prevented, rounded up, meaning one damage sources deal zero because the prevention is halved, rounded up. You round the prevention up, not the damage. Um, and otherwise, and that, have, that by the way, that applies to all your Crux units too. I have so many people constantly trying to deal damage to Ghost of Pendragon, and I, I always, we're at locals, so I'll let them take it back, but like, that would, uh, that will usually not kill the Ghost of Pendragon. It takes a lot of damage to the Ghost of Pendragon when you have a Majestic Spirit in play, because it is also a Crux unit, and all other Crux units get that prevention. And finally, two copies of Crux Sight. Just in here is a way to get back ghosts and incarnate when we really, really need it. Um, it's, it's just a nice little extra card to have in case you need it. Uh, yeah, so that's that. That's the main deck. Uh, again, you're just trying to play controlling. You're trying to control the, the board as you level up. Level up as efficiently as possible. Use Temporal Spectrometer. Use Academy Guide. Use Dungeon Guide. Use your Floating Memory. Get to that high level and then just lock the game down. And, you know, sometimes you'll have turns where you don't do a lot. That's okay as long as you're keeping your control of the game and trying to build up that temporal spectrometer or something. Um, that is awesome. Our sideboard, and now again, I, I always tell you guys this, but, um, oops, I just shouldn't be scrolling around here. I always tell you guys this, but the sideboard is totally dependent on your own personal metagame. Uh, what I have in here is a third copy of Innervate Agility and a fourth copy of Hurricane Sweep. That's when we have those heavy ally aggro decks and sometimes they can still just out aggro you so i just want to make sure we can get those in there we can remove a couple uh you know a couple later game cards because we just need to make it to the late game in the first place just to get these in here we have two copies of dematerialize this is a card that people aren't playing much either but let me tell you nothing feels better than de dematerializing your opponent's majestic spirit wind normally only can really like dream fairy it or zephyr it um and having the dematerialize in here is quite helpful um and yeah, it's, it's something we're playing around with mostly in here for Merlin, but also just can slow down certain other decks by materializing a key card, uh, a key regalia card at the right time. So just play your matchups out and see if you ever think it would be useful to do that. It's totally a tempo play, but that's really all you need when all you're trying to do is build up to Incarnate Majesty. And then we have a bunch of material deck cards in here, Nullifying Lantern and Quicksilver to go in against Erupting uh, or similar decks to shut down any of their fire graveyard shenanigans. Um, and then Terra Fring for other ally decks and Viridian because water is really obnoxious. And I, oh, I should have the, I'm sorry, I should have the current version of Viridian Protective Trinket. Last time, time I did a profile, someone reminded me that I need to point out that this is, this card's been errated. It does not have a banish clause. It is a constant effect of during your turn, water element cards your opponent activate, customer activate. And obviously, uh, getting your Incarnate Majesty Frostbound is a one-way ticket to Sadness, so you want to be able to put out this Viridian against the Water deck so your Incarnate can be played safely. So it's, it's got to be in there and you move it in in the board against the Water decks when you need it. So that's the list. That is Wind Hybrid. It's a super fun deck. I really encourage you all to, if you have the cards, try it out. Otherwise, start trying Temporal Spectrometer and some other decks, depending on how, like, just, it, you know, the metagame might shift where it's going to be a little more of a liability, but right now, there are a lot of decks where this is a free value card that uh, you're going to have games where you just get two or three cards off of it, and this is Grand Archive. That's a huge difference. So this card is worth trying, but this deck in general is extremely fun if you like grinding out, controlling the game, and taking over with a completely unassailable position against a lot of decks with Majestic Spirit in play, Hurricane Sweeps to take out the board, Veiling Breeze to prevent the damage, Zephyrs to control any random nonsense that comes your way. Uh, we've seen some Wild Growth Elixir aggro decks popping up in Cleric and, and Mage and some others recently. Um, Zephyr makes them really sad. Keep that in mind. So it's a uh, there are some good cards here, and of course, Innervate Agility, the catch all if they go for the blasts, if they go for the damage, you innervate, you're okay, you're safe, no problem. You have a million cards, just level back up again, you'll be good. So that's the deck. Hope you guys enjoy that. Let me know what you think of the deck and Temporal Spectrometer or whatever you want to in the comments below. Uh, and we will have more great Grand Archive content com coming for you very soon. Later this week, in fact, we should have some gameplay coming up, which would be really fun. I'm excited to show you guys that. And we'll have some more content coming next week and the uh, next episode of the podcast. All that stuff's coming. Hope you guys enjoy it, though. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you guys in the next one.